FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome, and you are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today is April 11th, 2018. Part of the problem in today's economy, oh, and before I get started, join the conversation, questions, comments, whatever, feedback, email me, kl at kerrylutz.com. So when we look at the discussion of the economy, there's a lot of misconceptions If you don't have the right diagnosis, then you can't have the right cure. Someone who is an expert at coming up with hopefully the correct diagnosis is Professor Steve Keen. You can find uh, Steve's work at Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Prof Steve Keen, K-E-E-N. Steve, welcome to the show. Good to be here, Kerry. So, you know, we're in this uh, kind of bubble economy. There's a lot of opinions as to how we got there and what needs to be done. If you had to summarize the current state of the world economy and its causes, what would it be? Uh, If I was going to summarize the state of the global economy in a nutshell, it would be simply we've got too much lead in our pockets and the lead is caused by excessive levels of private debt accumulated during several uh, recent speculative bubbles. And with that debt in our pockets, we are dragging our heels as we try to walk forward. Uh The only way to get forward is to get rid of the lead. So how do you do that, though? Because every everybody's debt is somebody else's asset, mainly banks and other financial uh, intermediaries, lenders, et cetera, yeah. the federal government. Uh, do we just knock zeros off the debt? Uh, what's this is, the way? This, 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 let's actually put some figures on the, the, the situation for people here because I know that you know, most people aren't as familiar with the data as I am. If you look at the level of private debt compared to GDP in 1945 for America, it was roughly one third of GDP. So in other words, if, if people devoted, if, if it was actually feasible, if people could devote their entire income to, uh, to paying off debt within, within four months, there would have been zero debt in the country. Mm-hmm. Now, now, fast forward to 2007, 2008, and your debt level hit 170% of GDP. So it increased almost by a factor of six over the period from 1945 to, two, to the financial crisis in 2008. And what that was doing is that when you borrow money uh, and you spend that borrowed money into the economy, you actually add additional demand, more demand than would exist if you didn't borrow the money in the first place. That sound, I might sound, pardon the expression, um, is bleedingly obvious okay to say in American yeah, radio? Yeah, you could say that. Okay, well, bleedingly obvious. And in fact, <laughs> the reason that it's not understood is that mainstream economists, the, the mob that I've been fighting about intellectually for the last uh, 40 years of my life, pretend that banks don't actually create money. They pretend that instead of what banks do is take into Deposits from one person, blend them out to another. In that case, your credit is my credit from the bank is your drop in spending because to be able to me to spend, they've had to take money out of your bank account. You can spend less, I can spend more. The two balance each out. There's no impact from credit. That is technically wrong. And for 40 years or so, people who are my predecessors like Basil, Basil Moore and Hyman Minsky and several others have been saying, that's just technically wrong. It's not how banks operate. We've been ignored. Now, after the financial crisis, places like the Bank of England or the Bundesbank are coming out and saying the rebels are right, the textbooks are wrong. So when banks lend money, they actually add credit to your account. It doesn't come at anybody else's expense. They create debt on the one side of the ledger, money on the other you can spend. That boosts the economy. So total demand in the economy is not just the turnover of existing money, which is the Milton Friedman monetary way to think about it. It's the turnover of existing money plus new credit, which is identically the same as new debt. Now, what that means is when you've got an economy where people are borrowing lots of money and spending it, it looks like a booming economy. But as you that boom, the, the price you pay for that doom is a rising level of, of private debt, which you have to service over time. And that has all sorts of effects. But you get to the point where the banks aren't willing to lend and to extend anymore because they're worried about your capacity to repay the debt. Individuals can't afford to take out deposits anymore. The houses are too expensive, et cetera, et cetera. Everybody stops spending. And what that can mean is credit can go from being a very substantial uh, additional 
to demand out of turnover existing money to negative. And if you look at the uh, American economy in 2007, in 2007, the, the level of credit, which is the increase in private debt every year, the level in credit that year was roughly 15% of GDP. That's the maximum it had been in the whole post-war period. Then when the subprime bubble burst and people were watching house prices fall rather than rise, liquidating their debt, going bankrupt, jingle mail, et cetera, et cetera. That plus 15% fell to minus six. And that was the first time in the post-war period that credit had been negative, in other words, the change in debt was negative rather than positive. So you went from credit adding 15% of GDP to total demand to subtracting 6% from it. That's why you had a financial crisis. They've come out the other side, and because a whole lot of factors as to why Americans are back borrowing money again, but you are now borrowing uh, borrowing more money once more from the banks, both for housing and to some extent for corporations, share buybacks and some investment. So credit demand in America is running at about 6 or 7% of GDP right now. And that's why you've had, in addition to Q, the impact of QE, you've had a bit of a recovery. But you are still carrying a level of private debt, which when you correct for differences in series over time, is higher than the highest level of private debt America carried during the Great Depression. Wow. And you, you're not going to have much demand. You're not going to have growth. You're going to be what I call a walking debt of debt. Yeah, zombie economy. Yeah. Yeah, so some way the debt's got to be reduced, right? Yeah. It's got to yeah. come down. And what is the least disruptive way of doing that to to keep things going? Because obviously if uh, you just have mass bankruptcies, that's, uh, that's not going to be, um, you know, that's not going to be yeah. constructive, to say the least. It, it, that, that's a very good way of putting it. And that's one of the problems with the liquidation advice that was given to Hoover uh, back at the start of the Great Depression, just liquidate the whole lot, let's get it fixed up. Irving Fisher, uh, who was one of the people who suffered from that liquidation, made the point that when you have the private sector paying off debt uh, and therefore trying to be using its current income and, and spending less than its income and trying to use that difference to pay its debt down, that destroys money and causes the economy to go further backwards. So it's a this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy that leads into a, a black hole of a, a total economic collapse. The only way to do it effectively is to write the debt off. And a lot of that happened during the Great Depression. The so-called bank holiday was a huge period of both consolidating banks and writing off debt that was simply unsustainable and so on. But that itself also affects economic activity. The best way to do it, and people are going to hate me saying this in America, but I'm going to have to say it anyway, is to use the government's money creation power to cancel that private debt without destroying money at the same time. And that is quite feasible because in a modern capitalist economy, talking just in terms of the domestic sector, there are two ways you can create money. Banks can lend out more than they get back in repayments, which is what they've been doing for the last 50 or 60 years until the financial crisis hit. But that means you get extra money as a borrower, but you get an exactly you match your liability. Back. There's no additional money created that way. Governments can create money by spending more than they get back in taxation. And there's no practical limit on them doing that. Now, if they waste the money, yada, 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 I no argument there. But what they can do, what they could do, is give everybody X amount of money, let's say, just for a sake of a hypothetical, everybody in the country gets 10,000 Australian American dollars issued by the government paid into their bank accounts. If you have debt, that $10,000 is written off against whatever debt you currently owe. And there's all sorts of complications that apply to that because of all the debt covenants that banks have created, all the you know, special all the special terms tied up in CDOs and so on. That's that's I'm not saying it's easy to do that. But fa fundamentally, reduce the debt by $10,000 of anybody who is in debt. Anybody who doesn't have debt, give them $10,000, which they can only use to buy shares in corporations where those shares themselves can only be used to cancel corporate debt. And the reason I'm saying that combination is, first of all, you have no impact upon demand in the economy directly. You don't boost or reduce demand. Money supply remains constant in the process. And what you do is you give people shares who missed out on having shares before in the, who didn't have shares before the, financial crisis, basically with the poor and the working class of America, 
QE, as, as was practiced by the Federal Reserve for the last 10 years, has massively boosted the value of shares for those who own shares in the first place. It's massively increased inequality. It's been totally the wrong socially social policy to follow, even though it did end up causing a, a triple of stimulus for the economy. We could reverse the damage done to the distribution of income by government action through the Federal Reserve's QE by using this approach, which would give everybody share ownership and reduce corporate debt at the same time. So to some extent, democratise capitalism uh, in reverse of the way it's been made more of an elite system by the Federal Reserve in the last decade and reduce private debt in that process and get people getting getting more equity basis for how firms are financed rather than debt basis at the same time. But to, to some extent, at least, you're rewarding bad behaviour right because people took on that debt and whether it's 10,000 or 50 or whatever the number might be it's kind of irrelevant uh, and uh, it's it's like are you really solving the problem the, well, solving the it's, it's not, it's, it, the actual reason I came up with the idea of a modern debt jubilee where everybody gets the money is precisely because of that point. Because when I was talking about needing a debt jubilee about a decade ago, people were saying, well, you're going to reward people who speculated. What about those who were sensible and didn't borrow money and didn't speculate? Mm. And I said, basically, you're right. Um, yes, we have to do something for them. And the idea was, well, why not use the government's money creation capacity not to cancel private debt only, but to create the money that's used to cancel private debt, give it to everybody on a per capita basis. So everybody gets the same amount of money. You get $10,000. Rupert Murdoch gets $10,000. I think the $10,000 would matter more to you than it does to Rupert. So it just, yeah. it's, it's equal across the whole society. And in the process, those who got the debt and might have benefited from leveraged asset prices and so on, um, and maybe suffer from the crash as well. They they are not going to be getting any shares out of it. They get a reduction in their debt. They don't get in, increased assets. The people who didn't speculate get ownership of shares, which will give them an income source over time. So there's no way in which you're benefiting those who borrowed money over those who didn't borrow money. It's equal to both groups. And uh, you also prevent the uh, banks from going under, and all the bondholders out there. So, yeah. so effectively, yeah. you've gotten rid of X amount of debt. I don't know what percentage that is. I don't know if if it's ten percent or whatever. What about the government's ever never ending, increasing, accelerating debt? How does this uh, help that? Well, let's see. Let's, would you regard one hundred and twenty years as the long term? Uh, well, you know, for capitalism, for modern economy, for any him, uh, him any any person alive oh, yeah. today, one hundred and twenty years seem like yeah, a long term to you. Yeah, sure. Okay, okay. Over the last one hundred and twenty years, the average surplus of the American government has been minus two point four percent of GDP. Mm -hmm. In other words, a deficit, 2.4% of GDP every year. If you take out the First and Second World War, it's about 2.2% of GDP. So for 120 years, America's been producing, so it's been, been spending 2% more than it gets back in taxation every year. Now, that, according to most uh, the Austrian-style economists, are called rampant inflation. What's the rate of inflation today? I'm making empirical points yeah, here. It's understand. been doing it for one and a half, you know, over a century. And that's only because I've only got recorded data going back to 1901 uh, from the from the White House data. Yeah. So it's successfully doing this for enormous length of time. Why can it do it? The reason is it, it, whatever it's doing about its impact on you know, the value of the American dollar versus gold or the American dollar versus the euro and so on and so forth, within its own province, which is the United States of America, government money is accepted as full payment of anything somebody wants to buy. Sure. Okay. Now, that means that the, that gives it a capacity to use its money creation capability as much as it wants to. Now, what about this 2.4%, 2.2% figure I'm working on? If you look at that and you say, well, what's, what's the rate of growth of the economy in nominal terms on average over that whole century? Uh, it's been about of the order of 5 and 6% of GDP, 5 to 6% growth rate per year. If you divide that growth rate by the average of the turnover of money, wham, you get the 2.4, 2.2% figure I'm talking about. In other words, what the government's been doing, even though it's been trying to resist doing this, with the whole focus upon you know, what they call um, sound finance, trying to uh, only, only spend as much as you tax, 
what it's been doing is creating the extra money supply that the economy needs to grow. Mm-hmm. Even it's been trying to resist it. Now, the, once we understand that's what the government, the major function of the government has is to create the money that we use to make capitalism work. Uh, if we say that's what it does, then it's a question of what's the right rate of growth of that money supply over time. And it happens to be the effective rate of change of the nominal GDP divided by the velocity of circulation of money. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it can do it. And of course, the government services its debt by making accounting entries at the Federal Reserve. If and you look at all the um, if the gov- when the government issues bonds and they need to be serviced, the servicing is done by entries between the Treasury and the Federal Reserve. Now, is is the Federal Reserve going to run out of computer digits? No, never. Okay, so this this is the thing. It's practically possible. It's not it's not a case of whether it's feasible or not feasible. And this was actually understood at the end of the Second World War by I've forgotten his name right now. Unfortunately, I need to look it up. But the, I think it was Eccles. Uh, mm-hmm. the right. then Federal Reserve, Federal Reserve. Uh, chairman. Yeah, yeah. Right. because he said, well, look at what we did during the Second World War. We financed a, a change in government spending, which you know, produced all the military gear that helped subdue the, the Nazis and subdue the imperial amb- ambitions Japan had at the time. We produced all that by effectively accounting entries. And therefore, there's no limit on the government's capacity to create money. It's how that money is used that matters. What are the impact on the level of employment, uh, rate of inflation, value of the currency, et cetera, et cetera. And they said what we should do is using that power sensibly. And if only we'd followed on from Eccles' insights, we might not be having this conversation. We might equally not be having, a, have, having had a financial crisis 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, well, that's often the case, right? It's often mm. the case. So the problem, though, of ever-increasing credit, what about the fact that interest rates are going up the government's got to monetize more of this debt, right? Um, and the government, the, the interest rates are uh, uh, one of those ethereal realities of capitalism. Actually, Marx said eight, decades ago, uh, you know, a century and a half ago, that there was no solid foundation for the rate of interest, one of these things that can go up and down without without limit. And in fact, Frank, he was frankly right. Um, but the Federal Reserve can afford to finance all of that it's it's it, what is the impact of that on the level of employment in the country, the level of inflation, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the issues that matter. Um, it's it's not going to have a problem in financing it because, again, as I said, it's accounting entries. Mm-hmm. It, it, only, only if they could run out of you know computers, zeros in a computer, zeros and ones in a computer, would they run out of the capacity to finance it. It's whether that's leading to more or less you know, mm-hmm. productive capacity in the economy, whether it's leading to more or less educated uh, workforce, healthy or less healthy people. Those are the questions that matter, not the practicality whether it can or cannot do it. So you're telling me basically the deficit doesn't matter? The deficit doesn't The deficit doesn't have to be zero. This is not saying it doesn't matter, but the ideal level is not zero. The ideal level is the rate of growth, nominal growth of the GDP divided by the velocity of money. Uh, that's of the order when you talk about a rate of inflation which people are comfortable with, which is something of the order of two to four, two to three, two to four percent. Nobody seems to worry about an inflation rate at that level. It's when you get into the six and eight and ten percent and twenty percent levels that people start to freak and justifiably because the, the basis of our monetary transactions is being undermined all the time. Uh, but if you look at a rate of growth of the nominal GDP of say uh, of, with the of, 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 Price level two to two to three percent, let's say, and real real GDP per head of about two to three percent. Then you need a rate of growth of the money supply of about three percent, because that's roughly six percent divided by two for the turnover of the rate of turnover of money when the economy is in a healthy state. Which, of course, at the moment it is not. Yeah, so that's the problem that it isn't, and yeah. how we get it there is the question, and. Basically, you're saying pretty much it's got it's up to the government. The free market can't do it. The free market. The, 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 this, people need to make a separation between what they when they think the free market, they think John Galt and they think industrial capitalists and stuff like that. That's the side of the free market I have all the time in the world for myself. Uh-huh. What they leave out of their thinking is the financial sector, and 
they or they or they paint the financial sector with the same brush with which they paste paint the industrial sector of the economy. Now, when you look at the industrial sector, you have to actually be an innovative engineer forward thinker, yada, 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 inventing something people actually want, you know, the new widget we're all looking right. for. That's that's the side of capitalism which uh, which we, we think of in a positive light. The financial sector creates money by double-entry bookkeeping. And they, by doing that double-entry bookkeeping, they get claims on existing assets. By creating a, the debt, which then gives you the money to go and build a factory somewhere, they've got a claim on you in case things go wrong. They get the factory. Right. Now, that that is that can amount to daylight robbery in the sense that you issue the debt. You don't care whether the venture works or not. You get the, the, the property as collateral. If it fails, bang, you suddenly own the factory and you can sell it for a profit. Um, it is... It is a, a side of capitalism. We have to. We, we need it. It's essential. You can't have a capitalist system without money. You can't have it without a financial sector. But you have to contain the financial sector. And the trouble is, all the rhetoric people use about how great it is to have free market capitalism, et cetera, et cetera, is thoughts sponsored by you know the Edisons of the world, the Elon Musks of today, and so on. But applied to the Goldman Sachs and the the uh, the Rothschilds, and I'm not being racist at all in saying that it's applied to the financial sector where the financial sector only gets the power to create money because it's been given a license to do so being being allowed to create banks and that's a social responsibility which they can and have always abused yes once we understand it we can limit it and then make the financial sector the servant of the industrial sector which is what i want to see yeah and they continue to abuse it to this day yeah uh, as we see uh you know getting bailed out by the federal government, by the Fed, all over the world. I mean, every yeah. every major bank in the world was pretty much bailed out. And what about the Chinese model, which is basically no concern for the solvency of their banks whatsoever. They just continue to make loans to state-run enterprises, inefficient, uh, kind of cowboy capitalism, uh, what we had here maybe a uh, hundred years ago. Is that a model for success in the long run? Oh, I, th- I think you're mixing your metaphors there a bit. Um, <laughs> it, it's a very, very controlled form of Wild West because it, it's still a communist country. And if the Communist Party tells you to do something, you have two choices, do it or you know, right. something more yeah. or less pleasant than death will occur to you. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, uh, it, it, not the Wild yeah. West as we knew it in America. But what, what that means is China's basically harnessed the power of money to do what they damn well like. And they've, first of all, got a huge trade surplus. And this is one point where I actually agree with Donald Trump. You have to do something to rein in China. We should be reigning in global trade surpluses. And that's yeah. the one thing I do want to see balanced. Uh, mm-hmm. The trade deficits should be close. There should be, on average, trade deficits should be pretty damn close to zero. Uh, and China's definitely benefited out of running a tra- trade surplus, as has Japan, as has Korea, as has Germany, and so on. So but what the Chinese are doing is, first of all, they created this huge credit bubble after the financial crisis hit because again people t- tend not to, to remember these things but when the crisis hit china's exports fall exports fall about 40 percent right now that was slaughtered uh, their factories on the on the eastern seaboard because most of the production is done on the coastal factories and in china because being a communist country uh, you had a particular point region to which you were supposed to be associated and if you weren't in that region and you lost your job you got no social security now that meant something at the order of 50 million chinese workers on Not the on coast the eastern coast were hopping on trains to go back to the to the uh, you know, peasant lands they came from and they weren't particularly happy and um, i don't if you've ever seen a Chinese demonstration, I have. Oh, yeah. You don't want to be I on the receiving end of that. Yes, uh, yes for So sure. the, the Chinese Communist Party reaction to that was we've got to stimulate the economy dramatically, and they basically told the banks to go and lend to anybody with a pulse. And what you got was that huge property bubble, and the scale of, of credit creation in China was astronomical. In 2008, roughly speaking, Chinese private debt, which is obviously it's issued by, by, by state banks, but it's the debt is owned by private corporations and private individuals and so on. Uh, that was running at about 100% of GDP. Fast forward to today, it's roughly 220% of GDP. And in one year, 
the level of credit was 40% of GDP. Now, that's two and a half times as big as it got, more than two and a half times as big as it got to be in America. That was a huge stimulus. Now, that led to all the – have you seen, have you been to China and seen some of those ghost yes. cities? Oh, yeah, I've seen them. I saw yeah, a city well, that looked yeah. just like New York. It was modeled after New York. And yeah. It was kind like of like I, a stage I a, set. <laughs> I had a, a girlfriend in, um, in, a, in a, the fourth tier city outside uh, the capital of Sichuan, and she bought in one of these apartments. So actually being inside, you know, the apartment owned by, owned by a, a Chinese uh, person and seeing the state of it. I mean, you had to knock on the lift door to get the operator to come down mm-hmm. and take you up to a level. You step that into bare concrete. The inside yeah. of the, the – there were there were pipes on the walls to nice. take where the power would go, but there was no power attached and no water. And there were – I think there were – about 20 or 25 story, 25 uh, or so buildings, each 30 stories high, and there's a workforce of 12 laying out the garden, and the four or five stories of uh, of parking beneath the building had one truck in it. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is the typical sort of thing we saw. So there's right. a huge amount of waste there. But everybody yeah. had a job, everybody was working, and everybody was eating hot pots in Sichuan restaurants. Mm-hmm. So it, it stimulated the economy massively. Now now it's falling over, and a lot of those people are not going to be able to pay back their debt. Um, the, the, a lot of the property developers will fall over and so on. There's all sorts of fictional data in the Chinese system. But sure. I've seen estimates from you, – you, can, you can't trust Chinese data, of course. No. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you, you did one little joke. People might know this. Do you know what the unemployment rate is in China? Um, I don't know because you know. Well, I can I can I can put you out of your misery. It's four point zero nine percent. Yeah. You know what? When it was last year. Same, right? Four, four point yeah, four point. It's been four point zero nine percent for the last changes. ten years. Yeah. If you believe if you believe that, I've got a bridge I want to sell you. Yeah. Um, so you, you can't trust their data. You've got to see other people doing research on things like uh, energy outputs, right? Uh, electrical you know, movements of trucks yeah. and stuff like that. But on that basis, I've seen some blogs estimate the level of Chinese deficit spending right now. So government spending and excessive taxation, which it can do just as well as America can in its own province, is running at fifteen percent of GDP. Really? Now, that, that is one and a half times the size of the stimulus under Obama. It is three times the size of the New Deal mm-hmm. as a percentage of GDP. And what it is financing fundamentally is not just activity in China now, but it's financing the whole Silk Road project. Mm-hmm. So there, because now people accept... You know, uh, if you're in Kazakhstan and China says they're going to build, you know, a high-speed rail system going through you, which you which you can use to send your goods, and yes, they'll send in Chinese workers to do it, using Chinese goods to produce it, Chinese steel, Chinese concrete. Uh, you, you're actually expanding the range of the fiat of Chinese currency. Mm-hmm. And even though it's been a total stuff up in terms of the, you know, masses and masses of skyscrapers that will never have anybody living inside them on one one hand. Equally, it's also they've built one of the best high-speed rail systems in the world. They're building trade routes for Chinese goods. They're actually using money as a form of imperialism very successfully. So I expect I think China is having a credit crisis right now. Uh, the, the bubble credit bubble has burst and there are people going bankrupt and so on. But there's such a level of money activity being financed by the the government money creation, it's making up for it. And those Chinese workers still have jobs. So um, they can get away with this for quite some time, so long as people continue accepting the expansion of Chinese influence throughout uh, uh, eastern toward, towards Western Asia and in, into Europe itself. And they're being pretty successful at it. Interesting. Well, we've basically run out of time. I could go on with you for hours on this topic. It's so fascinating. And your perspective is so much different than others. And maybe even perhaps a little bit hopeful, (coughs) might add. Uh, If we want to find you, just give us the Patreon site to where we can find your latest postings. Yeah, that's uh, www.patreon.com slash Prof Steve Keen. Uh, most of my posts there are, are up freely. There's some there's, of my podcasts. I uh, the People have got to subscribe to get the podcast, but they can find those links for free. And over time, I'm going to be uh, transferring those to a new website. I'm calling profstevekeen.com, but I'm afraid I'm a one-man show and I haven't got, that, <laughs> I got organized there yet. I totally empathize with you. We are in exactly the same situation. So I know <laughs> from uh, where you speak. Anyways, if you've got any questions for Steve, myself, want to participate in the show, just email us, kl at kerrylutz.com. Twitter feed at Kerry Lutz, Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. Steve, been a total pleasure. Thank you so much for uh, for joining us and, and sharing your wisdom. Been a lot of fun. Thanks, Kerry. 
FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.